So right there, I create new heavens, new earth. Now, that word create is kind of cool because that word right there in the Hebrew is a word that can only ever be attributed to God. So in Hebrew, that word is bara, which means to create something from nothing. We are going to be finishing through chapter 66, Lord willing. But I I want to make sure you guys know next week we are still meeting for our Wednesday night service. And we are going, I want to go through the book of Isaiah in like a 30,000 foot view. And just, how many of you guys remember chapter one from over six months ago now? I don't. Oh, you do. Good. I'm glad some of you guys do, because I want to take a look at some of those things that are are very poignant and very important there. So that'll be next Wednesday. Tonight, we are going to be in, starting in chapter 64. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for this day, and thank you for the time of worship we just got to spend in. Lord, just again, setting aside those, those worries, those anxieties, even for a time. And Lord, as we open your word, Lord, I pray that as we open it, that we open our hearts to you as well, Lord, to see those, the nuggets of truth, the pieces of, of Scripture that we ought to carry with us, and, and the promises and the encouragements, but also, Lord, the warnings in there as well, that we, we know what you are about, and for us, your people, to be about your things. We thank you, Jesus, for that. We thank you for your instruction and your word here, Jesus, and it is in your name I pray. Amen. Alrighty, so chapter 64 picks up exactly in the middle of that same prayer from last week. So if you missed last week, then uh, let me just give you a little bit caught up. Right about halfway through chapter 63, starting there in actually verse 7 and 63, there is a prophetic prayer that is being spoken effectively in the mouth of one of the Babylonian exiles from Jerusalem. And they are prophetically, and Isaiah is prophetically praying on behalf of these people. Some, some of them are going to have this heart of this prayer, which is contrite. It is broken. It is looking for the things of God. So we ended right there in the middle of that prayer there at the end of chapter 63. So 64 continues on in this idea, this prayer that is going on. So it starts out, verse 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down, the mountains shook at your presence. So we haven't done, we haven't done a study in Exodus in a while, so you know this may not be fresh in your mind, but if you know back in the exodus of the Israelites as they are traveling from Egypt to the promised land. They saw many incredible, and I say that not in the not credible way, but in the most awesome way, that these wonders, there was pillars of fire, the the Red Sea split, and there were all the plagues of Egypt, all of these supernatural miracles that they are experiencing. And none of the people here who are speaking right now were alive for that but they want to see it. They know it's been passed down. They know that God is powerful. And as we've seen throughout Isaiah, that they felt, the people felt that they were kind of forgotten by God, that God had divorced them and separated from them. So they wanted to see God's might again. They wanted to see, they wanted the closeness of God. But right here, this prayer goes into asking God to rend the heavens, to shake the mountains. When they were camping there next to Mount Sinai, there in in the Exodus, they, God came down on Mount Sinai and shook the mountain shake the mountains. There's one of the songs that we sing that I I really like is shake the mountains, make the the walls fall down. And that is where that comes from, is that he is performing these miracles. And not just, and I say this um, um, in, in a very respectful way, not just personal miracles, like healing the sick, healing the blind. It was earth-shaking, literally, miracles that he was doing, and they want to see that. They, and why is it that this prayer is prophetically praying that? And that is because he wants the nations to know them. He wants the adversaries to know that God is mighty, that they will know your presence. And then verse 4, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor has seen, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. 
So this is uh, directly, this is, this is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'll, I'll give a little bit of context in there. I'll read it there. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 10, because he's, he's the, the context here is that he's talking about spiritual wisdom and here uh, in contrast to human wisdom, typically what you might call worldly wisdom. But he says in chapter 2, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who co- are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, for which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, and here's where the quote is, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So right there, Paul is, is having some partial fulfillment of this prophecy, of this, this prophetic prayer here, that no eye has seen nor ear has heard of any other God but our God. And then here, it is that even goes beyond that. Even these things that are a mystery to the man. God was a mystery to man before Jesus came. And there are still many mysteries of God. And, and he, he makes them more revealed, more plain as we progress in our faith with him. But here, they have been revealed through his spirit. So these mysteries, we are able to see them now. Our, our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears, we're starting to be able to pick up on what God is saying, hearing and or is saying so that we can hear, we can see, and that is something that we, again, do as we mature and grow. So continuing on, he, the very last line there of verse 4, it says, who acts for the one who waits for him. So indicating, God, you are going to act for the one who waits for you. Verse 5, you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways, we continue, and we need to be saved. So it, on a surface level, it seems like this, this prayer, this, this uh, redeemed, who, this remnant of Israel, is trying to justify himself before God by saying, you meet him who rejoices. Oh, I'm rejoicing and, and does righteous. Oh, I'm, I'm doing righteous things. But that is not what he's trying to get at. He's not trying to justify himself before God because it is more that he's trying to give context and credence to the following statement to understand that saying, regardless of whatever good we have done, whatever these things that we have been working on, we still have sin. There is still that issue. But interesting though, to bring that up, how often we do try to justify ourselves before God. Oh, you know, Lord, it, it was because that he was really making me mad that, that I, I yelled at him or they, they really cut me off really close on the freeway that I cussed him out or whatever it is. We, we try and find these justifications. You think of the first one in the Bible with Adam and Eve. Adam, <laughs> it was that woman you gave me, Adam says to God, and then Eve says, it was that serpent, right? And then it's just the, the blame game and trying to justify why we sin, why we do the things that we do. When really it comes down to us, it comes down to a Jesus problem. Do we have Jesus in our hearts or do we not? Romans three nineteen through 23 says this, And now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become a, uh, guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So back here in... Um, in Isaiah, recognition of sin, knowledge that there was sin, that there is a problem, there's a separation with God. Back in Romans, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the kicker. We have all sinned. I, I like that Paul actually gives the good news before the bad news <laughs> in this context here, but he lays it out. It is only in faith in Jesus because we know that we have sinned. There, there is no doubt. How many of you, I hope no hands go up, how many of you think that you're perfect and that you are right before God without Jesus? Good, no hands went up. <laughs> it is that when, when that is asked of us on that day, on judgment day, when it says, are you, are you holy, are you righteous? 
Not a single one of our hands is going to go up, but guess whose hand goes up, and that's Jesus. Just as Paul says here, through faith in Jesus, to all and on all who believe. So this prayer, back here in Isaiah, he recognizes that there is sin. There is something that needs to be fixed. We need that very last line. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. Praise God, we have that answer. We have the name of Jesus, of Yeshua, of, of Emmanuel, Christmas season, God with us on our lips and in our hearts. So we have that. So then he continues on in this thought here that um, there are issues. We are unclean. He's, he's actually, it's a very eloquent and a very, I'm not going to say beautiful, a very uh, picturesque way to describe what, what is happening when sin comes into life. Verse 6 Isaiah 64, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, and there is no one who calls on your name. Who stirs himself up to take hold of you? For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Like I said, this is a very uh, concise way that he is describing and, and using kind of imagery to describe the sin and what happens. We are like an unclean thing. Now, this is, um, this filthy rags, real quick is, I'm, and by real quick, I mean I'm going to talk about it for five seconds. I'm never going to talk about it again. The filthy rags are menstrual clothes. They are cloths that women would use when it was their, their favorite time of month. And it was one of the, it, it was not just, okay, you toss them away and try and reuse them or anything. It was, no, you burn these. These are not cloths to be reused. They are the, the most unclean piece of clothing that you can think of. And that's why he uses that imagery here. For our sins are like the most dirty thing that you could possibly think of. And even our righteousness, rather, our, even our good works are still as like these most unclean things. But then continuing on, he goes about the unclean things, and then he says, we all fade as a leaf. Now, that imagery is, is really interesting there, because if you think about it, as we continue in sin, if we continue in sin without Jesus, the, the weakness of our spirit grows. The weakness grows, and eventually it just falls away to, to an empty husk. And that, that is so true. The deeper into sin we get, the more empty we become. And then it says uh, our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And that means that we have no power to stand against that temptation. When we are in sin, there is no power in us to be able to stand against those temptations. And then the last part, and there is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. Even in our unclean and unstable condition, we didn't seek the Lord the way that we should. We were lazy or complacent before the Lord. All right, so that, again, that is a, a recognition. That is a confession right there of sin, of what is wrong, the separation from God. But he doesn't leave it there. I, I, I really appreciate that outside of a, a couple <laughs> uh, authors, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations pop into mind, it doesn't leave on a down note that there is always that turnaround that God has redemption in mind. So continuing on, verse 8, he says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you, our potter, and all we are, the work of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we all are your people. So three times in the Bible, the potter and the clay, in conjunction together, there are many other instances of potters being talked about, but the potter and the clay are used in regard to our relationship with our creator, God. So there's this one here in Isaiah, where it is specific again, potter, and clay to be molded. And then Jeremiah 18, verses 4 through 6. And this is poignant, so I do want to uh, read it here. It says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. And then the word of the Lord came, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do this with you as a potter? Says the Lord, Look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you, in my hand, O house of Israel. And then the other time is in Romans 9, 20 and 21. It says, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the power, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? So it, on a surface level here, it seems like a rebuke specifically here in the Romans one, but I see it more as an encouragement. 
Look what happens. He, he, he's, he's, the rebuke is in that he's saying to someone when, when they are the clay, and he says, oh, why have you made me this way, God? Why, why is it that I'm like this? But the encouragement is, is that, you know, God is going to make you, he's going to form you into to something that is in his will, that is beautiful. So don't be complaining about why, you know, that, that pot over there has, has two handles on it, and you've only got one handle. <laughs> you guys can imagine that, right? You know, we're pots and clay calling each other. <laughs> so it is, it is so sad because we do that. It's, it's like looking the, the gift horse in the mouth. God has made us into something, and then we complain about it. Why are we doing that? Instead, have the encouragement that once God forms you, and sometimes, like it said there in the Jeremiah one, oh, it was marred, got to, got to start over, got to, got to build you up again. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes the process can be painful, but it is the beauty in the end that God has for us. So here, when he's talking about it here in verse 8 again of Isaiah, it says, but now, Lord, you are my father, we are the clay, you are our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. So this one is straight encouragement, just, God, we are in your hand, do what you want with us, and we are not going to stray from that. So then verse 9, do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we all are your people, a plead to God. And then here's some more pleads uh, about the city. Your, verse 10, your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple, where, your, where our fathers praised you, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid to waste. So now he's, he's trying to, uh, he, he's pleading with the Lord. The, this prayer is that, you know what, God, your holy city, Jerusalem, as we've talked about several times here, that God is not done with Jerusalem, he is not done with Israel, that it, in this instance, or at this point, it is in ruins, it is burned to the ground. God, are you going to hold your hand back? Are you not going to help? So then verse 12, now this, this was, I had to, I was corrected here when I was reading through this because I thought when it says, you, uh, verse 12, will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? These things is not specifically talking only about the cities being destroyed, but also are you going to restrain yourself because of these things, including the sin that, the, that man has been afflicted by? Are you going to re- Restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord. Will you hold your peace and afflict us very severely? So leaving with two questions here. And it is that he knows the answer. This this prophetic prayer, Isaiah writing this down and, and prophesying it, he knows the answer. God is not going to hold back because of it. They know they need a Savior, and God has already said just a couple chapters ago, that if there is no man who does raise his hand of righteousness, that he himself will come in and he will be that salvation. We know that, again, I, I praise God that we are on the other end of this because we, we are not having so many of those questions, those mysteries, because it is Jesus. We know that he sent that Savior, and he didn't leave it there with a question mark. He had an answer. Chapter 65, verse 1. It says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. If you're in the King James there, in the New King James rather, you're going to see the capitalization of me. So this is God speaking. Not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. That verse 1 we fall into that verse one. He's talking to the Gentiles, the people who are not Israel, the people who are not Jews. They are the ones that are calling out, here I am, here I am. There is, is one of my most favorite. Do um, you guys know what a meme is? If not, God bless you. Stay that way. But I'm going to kind of explain it. So there's my favorite meme is there are twin boys uh, in this little video, and one of them is trying, is is the parent is trying to force feed him this spoon and is not having it. He's just pulling away. He's like this. And that baby is labeled the Jews. The spoon is labeled the gospel. And the begging other twin brother is leaning out of his chair to try and get a bite of the gospel. And I think that is exactly, that is just great evocative imagery, that that is exactly it. That God has brought, he says to the Jew first, also to the Greek, that he brought this gospel. And the Gentiles, again, that falls on us. We are Gentiles, that we are crying out for it. Here I am, God, here I am. I am broken. And we don't have the old covenant as Gentiles. We only have Jesus. Here I am. And that, that is such a, a beautiful picture. 
And then you see the other side of that coin, the, the, the heart of God, the broken heartedness of God here in verse 2 and so on for a little bit. When he says, I have stretched out my hands to a nation, I have stretched out my hands all day to, to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not according to their own thoughts, or who according to their own thoughts. Remember, we talked about several weeks ago that when we walk by our own thoughts, it is going to lead into sin. Verse 3, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of bricks, who sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs. That right there is a direct against, directly against Numbers law where it says you shall not touch dead things, unclean things. They who eat swine's flesh, again, against direct Levitical law. And the broth of an abominable thing is in their vessels. They who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. Those are very dangerous words. I'm holier, than, that's the holier than thou mentality, right? Where, where people get, stick up their nose and look down their nose at people and, and become haughty and prideful. And God says, these are smoke in my nostrils. A fire that burns all the day. You see his heart here that he, is, he was reaching out to them day after day, reaching out, trying to, to get through these, these, to these people that he loves. These are God's people, Israel, Jerusalem, the Jews. They are God's chosen people, and he wants them to know. And they are in constant rebellion. Sad, and, and I think of that, that picture of Jesus on, the, on Mount Zion, and he's, he's looking over the hill to Jerusalem, and he says, you over Jerusalem, he says, O Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you like a mother hen will gather her chicks, but he, you would not let me. You know, there's a, a show called Godspell, and if you've seen that, it, it's a great musical, and when we hosted it here, um, the director and the, the man who was playing Jesus uh, did that scene, and um, he, he, was, he grew up Lutheran, he, he, he was a believer, but really that scene changed him because he, he w started crying when he was reciting the lines because he realized the anguish in Jesus' heart and God's heart for his people. He doesn't want us to be separated because that separation is, is Gehenna, is death, is hell, is separation and pain without him. His heart is for you, is for his people. So, we see here that God's heart is for the people. And then moving on into verse, I skipped a chapter, rewind. <laughs> I was confused. And then he says, behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but I will repay, even repay into their bosoms your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together says the Lord, who have burned incense on the mountain, mountains and blasphemed me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. So they are going to be punished. They, they, he will not stand aside forever. There has to be judgment there. Verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah and an heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Acre a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. So in that previous chapter's prayer, so the, the second half of 63 and all of 64, that person praying. That was not the heart of every single Babylonian exile. And that was not the heart of every single Judean who was captive. It was a small amount. And that has continued to be the small amount that are seeking God, that actually want the things of God and not just empty religion. We see with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, that it's empty religion. They're just seeking the law and they're seeking to puff themselves up. Not all of them. Again, there were some Pharisees that, like, like I think, Galileo and uh, Joseph of Arimathea and um, several other Pharisees who came out from that and saw that Jesus was the way to go. Now, God is so faithful because he says, all right, I'm not going to wipe off every single one off the face of the planet. I'm not even going to wipe out a lot of the bad ones who are really going to be rebellious and be fighting against me. I'm going to be merciful, and I'm going to preserve 
the land. I'm going to, because think about it, if he had wiped out all of the re wicked, rebellious ones, there'd, there'd be, you know, hardly enough of God's people left to take care of the land, to inhabit his cities. So God is merciful there, and, and his mercy is, abounds here in the next couple of verses as well. Verse 11. It says, But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering for many Therefore, I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. That's important, and shows it was of their own free will. God did not push them into this. God did not entice them into this rebellion. It was chosen. It was freely chosen by the people. But then, therefore, in verse 13, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Lord God will slay you and will call his servants by another name. What is this another, other name, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Acts chapter 11, 26. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You know, that, that word Christian means little Christ, you know, so, so it's followers of Christ is, is what that word means, and it has got, had many ups and downs and lefts and rights and people trying to redefine it, and it carrying so many different connotations where we had, you know, wars, crusades, and all these things that are honestly not of God the way that they, they went down, and you know, it starts to carry a bad taste. And even now, you sometimes think, oh, you know, I know some Christians and, you know, I really don't want to be acquainted with those ones because they're judgmental or, or hypocrites or whatever it is. But if we look at the, the strict definition and when they were called that, it was, it was an insult. It was like, oh, look at their, their little Christ running around just like their, their master, Jesus. But in, in reality, it is such a great name that we are called Christian, to be the ones who are following Christ. And that is what we aspire to be, is to become more Christ-like daily. So to become a little Christ, I think that, that is something that we should be going towards. Again, the connotations change with society and culture, but when we're looking at it here, that is what they were called. Is that the exact name that God is talking about here? It's one of the names. It may not be the, the one name that, that God is drilling down on, but it is one of the for, for sure names that God calls of his servants. And then verse 16, so that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. They're going to be forgotten. These troubles, they're gone. The troubles that were there, they're going to be hidden from God's eyes. He's not going to see those. So now, um, this, this is... Uh, I talked about a couple of weeks ago, Isaiah and, and a lot of the prophets, sometimes almost mid-sentence, will completely change thought and prophecy, and even um, a comma can denote, you know, a couple millennia, a couple thousand years. This is one of those. So verse 17, we are going to talk about the, beyond the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So right there... I create new heavens, new earth. Now, that word create is kind of cool because that word right there in the Hebrew is a word that can only ever be attributed to God. So in Hebrew, that word is bara, which means to create something from nothing. I can't create something from nothing. A friend of mine put, uh, actually built this pulpit. Do you think that he stood there and he's like, pulpit exists? And then, bam, there was a pulpit. No, that's not, that's not how it was. Actually, in, in your Bible, one of the other words that is create or creation to create is asa, which is to assemble 
existing materials. Now, man can do that. God has appointed man to create in that way, to assemble things, to, to find you know, discoveries. I think of like scientists discovering things. That is how God has ordained man to create, is, is it in that way in Asa. God is the only one who can bara, create something from nothing. Super cool, because that's the same word here. So he's actually talking about creating new heavens, new earth. These are, these are things that um, maybe aren't like, you know, theologically this is going to make or break your salvation, but it's super cool to talk about, to look at, and, and to study, and, and just have a good conversation, not to get in fights over. Please don't get in fights, people, over, <laughs> over the little things like this. But it is so cool to see, because he says that the, the former things shall not be remembered or even come to mind. So that mean, the former things, that, that being this earth, when we're with him, you know what, we're not going to even need to remember because the glory, the goodness of being in his presence there is so much greater than trying to even be called back to the time that was here. And then verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of the crying. 2 Peter 3.13 kind of touches on this, the new heavens and the new earth. It says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So right there, 2 Peter 3.13, he alludes back to here, the new creation of the new earth and the new heaven. And then in Revelation 21, verse 1, John, who is, is seeing this vision, this revelation of Jesus of the end times, in Revelation 21.1, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Uh, for those of you who are afraid of the ocean, guess what? Uh, heaven's going to be awesome because <laughs> there, there's no ocean there. Now, isn't that interesting? So with that context, with John's context, we see that this new heaven, this new earth, this new Jerusalem takes place after the great white throne judgment, which was in the previous chapter of Revelation in 20. So it is connected to the eternal earth, not the millennial reign earth. Now this is going to, yeah, this is, this is some deeper theological thing. So there's the millennial reign of Christ when Christ returns seven years, and be that seven years of tribulation or mid-trib, post-trib, pre-trib rapture, wherever you're at on that pre-trib, uh, <laughs> that is after those seven years, Christ reigns on earth for a thousand years. Now, some uh, really cool things happen in there. I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of verses. But the, uh, the temple rituals that are happening, because the temple rituals, they're going to begin again in the new temple that's built in Jerusalem. They are only going to be, uh, this is described in Ezekiel, they are only going to be a remembrance of the former days when Levitical sacrifice was required. And then it talks about the former nations uh, being there and that they, the nations are still there, but all of them are going to be serving the Lord instead. So then back here in our text, it says, I will rejoice in New Jerusalem, uh, nor the voice of crying. Then verse 20, no more shall an infant from, their life, from, from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Um, how many of you guys think that 100 years old is a baby? No, it's not. In our context right now, post-flood, when men and women are not living to be 1,000 years old, 100 years old, that, that's a good long life. But something happens in that millennial reign. This is, again, one of those commas where, okay, we're back to a different section of prophecy, that in this millennial time of Jesus' reign, that, we get to a, that the world is going to be brought back to a pre-flood ecosystem, and, you know, be that a water canopy, whatever it is, I, I'm not going to go deep into that. But, and with that, the biology of man changes, and then all of a sudden, man and women can live to be 1,000 years old. That's why it's saying, if you're going to be 100 years old, it's a travesty that you die at 100 years old, because that's still a child. Oh, and then the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. That person is accursed who dies before 100 years old. So then verse 21, continuing on in, the, in what's happening in the, in the thousand-year reign, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, eat their fruit. They shall not build and, uh, and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So 
under Jesus. Guess what? There's, you don't go and plant your trees and your, your vineyard and stuff, and then people come and steal it. You don't build your house, and then you have squatters come on in <laughs> and start trying to take it over. In that, there is righteousness in this reign. And then he continues for that last little part, verse 23. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. So, more, complica- more, more complication of, of, of what's going on here is that people are going to be having children in this thousand year time frame that's going on, right? And so they're going to be living. So you think, okay, well, that's going to overpopulate really quickly. Yeah, possibly. I, I don't know the, the logistics of it all. But I understand that they are going to be living life in, in a, not in a, in a perfect way to how God intended with the Garden of Eden, but in a much more similar way to how God intended with the Garden of Eden. And for man back then, then obviously we are living now. Again, super cool things to look at, to think about, to, to delve into, and I, I love to, to chew on it and, and just kind of talk about it with you guys. So then verse 24, finishing out this chapter, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So right there we see that there is a completely even ecological difference there where uh, the, the lamb and the lion together, the wolf and the lamb together, and there is no more predator and prey. Now, it seems like God may still have a little bit of a grudge against the serpent because he says that serpents, they're just going to eat dust. I, I'll let you think on what you think on that, but they're not going to be eating my rats anymore and, and other animals. It is, it is going to be, you know, for all of you vegetarians out there, vindication. Good job. You, you are prepared for that millennial reign. But the, the biology, the spirituality, the sociality, and the ecology of the world changes miraculously. Again, this is miracles... Just think about a chapter or two ago, the prayer is asking for God to come down to, to act again and make these world-changing things. And then just a chapter later, and Isaiah is prophesying that, yeah, this is going to happen, but it's way beyond what any of you guys can even imagine what miracles God is going to bring. So now, you guys doing good? One more chapter. We're almost there. Woo, someone's excited. Chapter 66 of Isaiah finishing out the New Testament, as it were, of Isaiah. And it says, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? So now Isaiah prophesying here, bringing it back around, kind of bringing it back into to perspective that, you know, God is great. His, he, his throne is the heavens. I mean, you, you look to to the skies, you look to the stars, to the moon, to the sun, anything like that, and you think, oh, that's God's throne, and the earth is his footstool. All right, well, I mean, maybe that's bigger than just like a, a toe stool, I suppose, but it is, it is that God is great. He is mighty. For all those things, verse 2, for all those things that my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. So uh, Stephen actually directly quotes this in, in Acts chapter 7, in uh, uh, 7, 49 and 50. I won't uh, read it to you because it's, it's a direct quote of that. But it is to emphasize the greatness of God and really to put in perspective his greatness. Because you think of any man, you think of the richest man in the world, right? Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and all, and all those men. Do you think that for any of them that the heavens is their throne? Is the earth their footstool? No, and maybe in their minds they think it is, but that is not the case. That is not true. Now, this word contrite, you've heard broken and contrite spirit. This word contrite is literally to be lamed, like, like a lame horse, or to be lame, not able to walk, to be disabled. And the, the understanding here is that it is an inability to stand upright before God because of the damage of sin, because of the greatness of God, we cannot stand upright for him. And those are the people that you see he is looking on. He is looking on the people who are trembling at his word, who are respecting God, who understand and fear the Lord. Those are the ones that he is looking on. So then verse 3, he says, He who kills a bull as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. 
He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. So will I choose their delusions. Pause right there on verse 3. So there is no comparison between a man and a bull. Because of that system, the sacrificial system, they, they kind of got into their idea, their head that, okay, well, I'm going to sacrifice this lamb, this dove, this pigeon, this whatever. Then I'm going to sacrifice it, and I'm going to be good. My sins are going to be washed away, and it's going to be no problem. God is going to smile on me, and it's going to be awesome. But God needs to rebuke that, because that is not the case. That is why, and that is very specifically why, it had to be that Jesus came as a man, and that he suffered, he lived a life, he suffered and died as a man, fully God, fully man. But he had to do that because when his life was forfeit, when he died, then that actually lined up to be exactly as, as Isaiah is laying out here, that it was a man died in a man's place. Now, these men here that he's talking about are, you know, puffed up. Oh, you know, I, I slayed my bull. We're good to go. And that's not the case. So, verse 4, So will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them? Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Remember, he repeated this in, in the previous chapter, this exact same phraseology, that when I spoke, they didn't hear. You know, you guys had your chance. You, you, I've been reaching out to you daily, and you didn't listen. In uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11, Paul says, God, and this is referencing here, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. You know, there are many delusions out there, many lies that I, that, that I think are tragic. I mean, Either that or you have to, it's that saying where you have to have more faith to believe in evolution or that the universe was created from nothing than it is to actually just believe that God is who he says he is. And those, I believe, are some of those delusions that are sent. The, the, how, how many years, billions, trillions of years old they say that the universe is now? I think that's a delusion. You look at the, the history of God, you go back that far, it's, you know, 6,500 years you look at it. So then... This is now talking about also during the Great Tribulation period, during that end times that this is happening. So when God calls, what do we do? Answer. That's what we should be doing. When God calls on you, answer him. Be about his way so that you can see when he's moving. You can hear when he's calling out to you. And then verse 5, hear the word of the Lord. You who tremble at his word, now addressing that previous person, you who are trembling, listen up. Here, here, here's being said. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, and said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. These are the Pharisees. These are the Sadducees. These are the ones who have empty religion, who are, are husks of what religion is supposed to be. Remember, perfect religion is that we are going out, we are going to the widows and the orphans. We are helping people. And that is, it is not the, you know, oh, you know, they took too many steps away from their door, they flipped on the light switch on the Sabbath. It, it, that's not what it is. Legalism is not what, re, what God calls religion to be. Now, that, that's an encouragement to us. That is, uh, if, if you are, don't get into legalism, first of all, is, is the big thing. But instead, be the ones, if you're being cast out because you are the one who is uh, just trying to follow God, doing the things of the Lord, then that's who he's talking to here, is you. Now, verse 6, the sound of, again, this is end times. Are we in the end times? Oh, probably. <laughs> verse 6, the sound of the noise, the sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Okay, so now this is addressing Jerusalem. This is addressing Israel, right? Now, that is really interesting about the uh, not having pain in, in the childbirth. That means the, the intention here is there was no, when, when they start uh, going at it again, uh, wars or, or conquering or anything, that uh, Israel is not going to struggle with it. There's not going to be pain in this conquering because God is going to make it ease, eased for her, eased for her to deliver this, this thing, this male child, it says. So then verse 8, he who, ha, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. 
Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I, shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn with her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. This is going to happen. So be ready, be excited for it. Rejoice with Jerusalem. Romans 8, 37, Paul says that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And as we're seeing here, when that happens, when God says, okay, Jerusalem, it's time, you're going to, quote, give birth. When, when this has to happen, it is going to be in a an incredibly conquering fashion in an amazing way that, you know, couldn't have been thought of before, let alone without God. So now verse 12, uh, I, I love this verse. This is one that I think is, is one we carry with us. We should, uh, especially with that imagery that's going to come here. Verse 12, for thus says the Lord, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her sides shall you be carried and be dandled on her knees. That imagery there of the, the flowing river of peace. Because let me tell you if, you, if you don't know God, you will not know peace. And, and the imagery with that river, it is, if, if you think of a river, it is strong, but it can be so gentle. And it is constantly being renewed. If you, if you have a river that is going along, it's going to be kept getting fed. It's going to be clean. It's going to be clear water. And that is the same imagery here, that as God's peace pours over you, it is going to be renewed. It is going to be clean. And it's going to be powerful, but it's still going to be gentle there. And we Gentiles were grafted in as a flowing stream. You think stream's a little bit smaller? No, well, that's okay. <laughs> because God loves his people, both us and the Jews. Now, verse 13, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So this is one of those more rare verses where it talks about God's, uh, you know, we think God the Father and these masculine things, and this is one of those more effeminate and one of those more motherly aspects of God, and that is the comforting side of God. Now, for, for you dads out there, when your kid skins their knee, you know, at four years old, who do they typically run to? Mom. That, that is 100% true in our house. I will try, and you know, I can comfort, but it is not the same when mom does. When, when our little girls fall, hit their head, or anything like that, I might be faster to hop up and go over and see them, but I'll, I'll hold them, and then I'll go, mom, and re reach out to mom instead, and it's like, okay, fine, okay, I see how it is. You love her more. <laughs> It is so true. Mothers are, are more comforting. There is nothing that can really replace that. And God's heart is that, is that of comfort for his people. Almost done. Are you guys doing good? We got like eight more verses and then we are home free. Verse 14, when you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. So we see the, we see the, the dichotomy there, the, the, the contrast. The hand of the Lord will be known to his servants, the hand, the blessing of the Lord. But then the indignation, the anger, the righteous anger will be known to his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fire and his rebuke with the flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Now this right here, this is why I hesitate and, and, and murmur a bit more during worship songs that say, God, send your fire. And it's like, where is your fire? Because um, sometimes, but very infrequently in the Bible, when God sends fire, is it a good thing it, it, that it is an encouragement? It is there. Think like Pentecost and such, and God does send fire in, in good ways as well. But for the most part, it is um, more so like this, where it is rending and anger and fury. So uh, t take that as you will. Not that I think it's unbiblical to sing those other songs, by the way. Those are, they're completely fine. It's just I, I hesitate a bit more in myself. So this is, God is going to come there. We know that he is, we saw in Revelation about the sword. We see here several times about God coming down and there being blood. That, that's the way it's going to be in the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon and such. So then 17, those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. So again, these people who are in active rebellion against God being consumed. 
For I know their works and their thoughts, and it shall be that I will gather all the nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So now we get to see that glorious day. We get a, just an, an inkling of it, of that glorious day when, when we are worshiping God in his presence. Verse 19, I will set a sign among them, and among those who, uh, among them who escape, I will send to the nations to Tarshish and Pool and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, to those coastlands afar off, who have not heard my fame, nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Look at this right here. Now remember, Ju- Judaism is not a, a very evangelistic uh, religion. It is not. But so that would be a little bit foreign to them to say, okay, well, you're going to send out people to the Gentiles to proclaim your glory. All right, well, you are, you are awesome, God. You are righteous, but, uh, you know, that's kind of not our gig, even though I think God maybe had more an intention with them with that because he calls them priests, right? He calls them to be the priests of the world. But that is prophetic for missionaries, for Christian missionaries to go out into the world because you think about all of the ones, I mean, you, I, I think personally, I, I probably know uh, two or three dozen people that have gone out either from here on mission trips or who are living long-term mission. Um, one of the, the other pastors here in the valley, his, uh, he spent, oh, it's not Romania. I'm going to say Romania, but that's not the right. Croatia, that's what it is. He did, I think, 15 years in Croatia, full-time missionary work. And God is saying that that's going to happen, that we are going to go out into the countries, into the Gentiles, and proclaim his glory. And then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations on horses and in chariots and in litters, on mules and on camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. So remember, there back at verse 18 is that all the nations are going to come together. This isn't just a, you know, just America or just... England or just any single country, it is all nations, all tongues, all people come together to worship him. So then here at the very end, verse 21 of this section, he says, and I will also take some of them for priests and Levites. Up to this point, that priesthood was still and is still very specific to Levitical priests, to how God ordained it back in the Old Testament. Now here we see that kind of broken. God is going to change it up, that he will take some of those people of all those nations and tongues to make them priests and Levites, to make them his, his effectively those worship leaders in his kingdom. And now the last couple of verses, a little bittersweet. You know, we're getting to the end of a book, but this, this is so, the, the contrast here is, is so interesting and and uh, poignant for us to pay attention to. Verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. So again, now looking forward to that, that after millennial reign. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. That glorious, glorious day. Now, throughout this entire book of Isaiah, there have been many peoples and kingdoms and nations that were judged, condemned, and even destroyed. But here at the very end of the book, look what God does. He says that his ultimate plan is to bring people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every background, every kind of person that you can think of to bring them before him and worship him. Now, this, this also this imagery here of the new moon from one to another and the Sabbath is interesting because that's actually how the book of Isaiah opened up. And I'll, I'll read this one verse real quick here where it says, uh, talking about the new moons and, and that in Isaiah 1, uh, 12 through 15, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. So right here at the beginning of Isaiah, God is rebuking them because of the new moons, the Sabbaths, because they were not doing them, not just correctly, but they weren't doing them with the heart for God. And then here at the very, very end of Isaiah, he says it will come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come and worship before me. So it is going to be made right in that time. All these things that you're trying to do and you're completely doing them wrong and and are rebellious, I'm going to make them right in this time. And then the last verse here, Uh, Again, to kind of bring it all 
uh, full circle. He says, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So Isaiah, he, he leaves it with a warning there. I mean, it is that it, more of an encouragement. They, the people who are worshiping, they're going to see what has happened to those who, again, freely and willfully chose to go against God. But he, he doesn't want that. He wants it to be that this is who have transgressed, who have chosen this thing for them. Now, that again, that, that uh, vivid imagery of, of the fire, and as, as Jesus talks about Gehenna, that burning trash pile, and that is likened to be the pit of fire, the, the, like hell. And exactly right here, the worm does not die. It's not that they're, they're corpses, but they're not dead. It is not that it is just blackness, emptiness, and, and nothingness, hell. It is specific things. And he, it is a warning, but it is also an encouragement that we are to be in that worship. There are two options here. There is to worship, and then there is the worm. And I, I much prefer the former there with worship with God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And let's pray, though, and uh, head on out. Jesus, thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this book of Isaiah. Lord, the, the prophecies that have already passed, the, the hundreds of prophecies in here that have passed regarding your first coming as Messiah, as Jesus. And I thank you for those that we can study them. We can see your faithfulness through the, the, the thousands of years that we get to read through here in the Bible. And Lord, I pray is that for some of those that, that are mysteries to us or, or just, uh, just cool to, to think about, to pray about, to look into the the reign of the millennial reign that you have before. And, and Lord, I just pray that we not get hung up on any of these side things, but Lord, that we instead focus in on your salvation, that when, when that prayer was praying, that there, be, there is a need to be saved, there is a need for salvation, that we see that you are the answer to that question. You are that salvation. And Lord, as we go out from here into the, the rest of this December month into Christmas time, Lord, give us courage, give us strength to share your love, to share your name with those around us. And we thank you, God, for this time, this life, this word, and, and your Bible. We praise you tonight, Jesus, and we thank you, and it is in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and go in peace as you follow Jesus.